All right, hello. Um, welcome to Benchmarking Sahara-Based Big Data as a Service. My name is Trevor McKay uh, from Red Hat. On the schedule, this was actually listed uh, as Matt Fairley. If you know Matt, he sends his regrets. He couldn't make it, so I'm filling in for him. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Ji Dong Yu and uh, Wei Ting Chen from Intel. Um, <clears throat> we put this thing uh, together. Uh, together. Um, so I'll be doing introductions, um, and then uh, Ji Dong will be covering uh, the performance data. So uh, we're going to start with why Sahara. Uh, Sahara's been around for a few cycles now. Uh, it's big data on OpenStack. We'll talk a little bit about um, what the motivation is uh, for having that as a service. We'll, we'll go into details, um, a little bit about the architecture and features. Um, then we'll cover uh, deployment considerations um, from a performance perspective. What do, you, um, what do you need to think about when you're putting these things together? Containers, bare metal, VMs, you know, where your uh, data is located, those types of things. Uh, and they'll uh, show some results um, that they came up with from Intel. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, where Sahara might go and specifically uh, what we're uh, going to try to do for uh, the Liberty cycle. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> big data is everywhere uh, these days. It's, it's really not sort of a niche thing anymore. Everybody's doing it. Um, my friend, new friend Asim here from Cisco uh, has extensive uh, experience in that. You can talk to him about um, use cases. Uh, if you're you know, working at Walmart or Yahoo or Facebook or Twitter, uh, or you're doing genomics like the uh, Swift stack guys we're talking about with um, Fred Hutch, uh, there's just piles and piles of data. The CERN guys write petabytes, terabytes, exabytes of data all the time. Um, you or, your, or someone you work with is probably running workloads uh, on something like uh, Amazon or uh, Azure or Google. It's just a reality. This stuff isn't going away. Um, so there's a few reasons to uh, you know, run workloads there. One is just virtualization, right? The benefits of OpenStack, we all know that. But uh, you also want these modern features. You want uh, storage. You want uh, database as a service. You want elastic MapReduce uh, type facilities uh, from Amazon. So uh, when you migrate to OpenStack, um, getting the core services isn't necessarily just enough. And we love Neutron. We love Cinder. We love Glance. We love all that stuff. Um, but it's the def core, and it's, it's really, really uh, important, right? essential. But on top of that, you start to need to add applications. And so uh, Newer projects like Sahara and Trove start to cross that boundary, right, between just core services and uh, applications out of the box so that you can do things uh, at the application level and you don't have to write them yourselves. So this is sort of Sahara's uh, reason to exist is to make that possible for you. Um, and of course, as the bottom line says, um, writing the uh, applications is complex enough without having to manage all the infrastructure. Um, let's see. OK, so big data uh, analysis is tough. Um, you have to acquire the data. There's a lot of it. That can be challenging. Uh, you have to organize it. Um, anybody who's worked in ETL knows that that can be hard, just uh, managing this stuff and shipping it around. Um, then you have to write your analysis, uh, figure out what questions you want to answer. Um, and you've got to take your output and, and do something with it, right? Present it to somebody uh, so that they have an answer for you know, some customer informatics question that they were trying to answer. Um, and again, uh, all that complexity is just in, in the domain space itself. Uh, that doesn't include the tooling and infra infrastructure you need to do it. So uh, this is why we made Sahara. And uh, some headline features here, in case you don't know what it is, Sahara gives you um, repeatable provisioning um, capabilities. So you define cluster topologies, what you want them to look like. You store it in a database. You load your images in from Glance, and you walk up, and you press a button. And in a few minutes, you have a Hadoop cluster, or a Storm cluster, or a Spark cluster, or uh, any other framework you want to write a plugin for. Um, so once your cluster is up, now you want to run jobs. And this is what EDP is about. That stands for Elastic Data Processing. Um, that's basically your job management system. 
So you might have bursty workloads. Uh, you might need you know, various kinds of storage. So we have things like cluster scaling. We've got integration with different, um, different storage types. We integrate with Swift, um, Hadoop-compatible file systems. Um, we also pay attention to security for you. Uh, and um, things like uh, service, like anti-affinity and, and high availability considerations so that once you have this up, uh, your cluster doesn't go away <laughs> or become you know, unserviceable. Uh, so these are all the things Sahara gives you. Here's a, a quick um, look at the architecture. So um, <clears throat> this giant blob in the middle is the main Sahara engine. Um, as most things in, in uh, OpenStack, it has a client that talks through a REST API. We have a page in Horizon. Um, within the main Sahara body, uh, that DAL box down there at the bottom is the interface to the Sahara's local database where it tracks state and those kinds of things. Um, it has provisioning logic in it, which talks through um, heat to build you clusters and uh, uses Nova to spawn instances, Cinder to set up um, uh, non-ephemeral storage. Um, we get our images from Glance. Uh, <clears throat> we use Swift to uh, store input and output data sets. And then, of course, um, there's the vendor plugin piece. Uh, vendors may be a mis misnomer because there's actually a, a collection of grad students uh, from South America who are doing awesome work. So you don't have to be a vendor to write a plugin for Sahara. So if you want to write one, just write one. So we, we should maybe change that name. I don't know what else to call it, though. Um, but the vendor plugins have the, um, the logic to spawn a cluster of a particular type and configure it at runtime. So you can see from this that actually Sahara is uh, in the big tent model of OpenStack. We're really a consumer. We consume. Uh, <laughs> a large majority of the OpenStack services and use them ourselves. I forgot to mention, there is a raffle at the end of this for this awesome biometrics gear that will measure your heart rate when you come to exciting talks like this. Um, so <laughs> stick around. You don't want to miss the raffle, OK? Um, let's see. <clears throat> so how do plugins work? Um, we have plugins for particular processing engines. So there's an HDP plugin for Hortonworks data platform. There's a Cloudera plugin uh, for the CDH stuff. Um, we have a vanilla Apache Hadoop plugin. Uh, we've got one for Spark, uh, Spark standalone um, deployment. We've got one for Storm. We really, any processing framework that you want to add, um, you can. I was just talking to somebody today who has a, a new storage system. Um, from their company, and, and they're thinking about uh, writing their own plugin uh, to be able to use their storage with Sahara. Um, so obviously, to, to vendors, this is a way to integrate with OpenStack um, and get accessibility to, to a user base uh, who's consuming OpenStack. Um, you know, you've got a you've got a, a big OpenStack cluster uh, at a place like Walmart or something like that. Um, they may have various applications uh, to run on their stack. One of them probably is going to be big data uh, processing, so it becomes one-stop shopping. Um, let's see. Oh, MapR. I forgot to mention that's relatively new. I think maybe last cycle um, it was being added. Um, Storm is brand new, um, and of course. And downstream distributions like RDO from Red Hat or uh, Mirantis OpenStack, um, those vendors will um, certify particular plugins, right? And they'll do all the QA, give you reference architecture so that you know when you go and deploy this thing, it's going to work, and I don't have to worry about it. Let's see how we're doing on time here. Oh, OK. Um, great, perfect. OK, so now I'm going to hand this over to uh, Jidong, and he's going to uh, go over the performance uh, findings with you. Good afternoon. My name is Jidong Yeo, and I work at Intel. Uh, our in, uh, we Intel are committed to cloud and big data, and uh, uh, we kind of believe um, for big data, moving to cloud is an inevitable trend. So that's why we work on this Sahara project. So when you start deploying a Sahara-based solution, there are a number of things you should to consider. Um, 
we, in this section, we will go through those considerations. It's kind of like a um, functionality benchmarking. Then followed by in this section, we will um, show a little bit of the performance testing we have done and the results. So it's the performance benchmarking. Then based on what we have seen in the functionality and the performance benchmarking, we are going to talk a little bit, a little bit about our um, envision of the future of Sahara. Um, then finally, uh, we will have a summary and a call to action. So, so the first thing you need, need to think about is the storage architecture. So there are basically two major different ways to provide the um, storage in Sahara. The first thing is you can let the tenant to provide the storage by themselves. By default, Sahara can help deploy the HDFS components within the virtual machine. Um, so the good thing for this mode is uh, everything is almost uh, as same as the traditional bare metal mode, right? The computer and the storage are co-located together. Mm. <clears throat> but the, pro the, the, the problem with this is that uh, since uh, when you run big data on top of cloud, you are actually expecting a, a on-demand service. That means you will uh, launch the uh, virtual cluster and the term terminate from time to time. So with this mode, you have to import the data from someone else because you can really run the data processing. And you have also need to persist the data back to somewhere before you can terminate the cluster. Right? That's not exactly the users want to see. So instead of this, uh, there's another option. is The tenant could provide the storage subsystem in another set of virtual machines. Uh, like the uh, scenario three in the chat. So with this uh, scenario, the storage VMs could um, persist longer than the computing uh, clusters. So that's kind of um, um, uh, fix the problem we are talking about in the first scenario. Um, in, those two, uh, in those two scenarios, the, the, sto the storage is actually a, a disk um, attached to the um, virtual machine. Um, so the disk could be either the ephemeral disk or the single volume. Um, with ephemeral disk, the good thing is um, the computing and the underlying storage actually co-located on the same physical machine. So there is still a chance for Hadoop to achieve data locality. But if you use single as the um, volume uh, backend, depends on how you implement the single service. You may use a LVM, which is co-located with the computer, or you may use a network remote, remote thing, uh, safe implementation or, or something. So in that case, you may lose the possibility to achieve data locality. The another way to provide a storage is, is admin could, pro, could um, deploy the storage subsystem in advance. Um, so in that way, the storage is actually logically disaggregated from the computing tasks. Tenants will only run the computing task within the virtual machine. Uh, but this implementation could be either physically co-located um, with the computing load or, uh, f or, or totally a network remote solution. So in the diagram here, uh, the scenario three, uh, uh, number two, uh, we deployed the HDFS in the computer node host level. Um, the HDFS system is external to the uh, virtual machine, but um, with the proper configuration, it's still possible to achieve uh, local data access. But in other scenario, the scenario number four, the virtual machines are accessing data in a network remote Swift. So in that case, all the data access will go to the network. There is no data locality. Uh, by the way, in, in both mode, if you, since the virtual machine needs to talk to the outside of the uh, VM, so uh, the um, network will, is very important. Uh, in our um, testing, we, we found that the new one of the new trans feature, DVR, is very helpful for this. So uh, our opinion is that um, a disaggregated storage system has much more values than a, um, 
a, a built in, I mean, uh, within the virtual machine storage system. So in a disaggregated storage sub subsystem can, uh, in this model, there's no da data silos. Uh, all the uh, virtual Hadoop cluster can share the data in the same system, so there's more opportunity to find the uh, potential uh, new BZG usage or something. And uh, another thing is, uh, with this model, um, Sahara may be able to leverage the OpenStack Manila service. So that means Sahara may be able to call the Manila API on behalf of the tenants and let Manila to handle all the uh, storage provisioning since Sahara is just a consumer of the Manila services. Then this approach also can create a, a, a more opportunity to the vendor so they can build, this, build some advanced solutions. For example, uh, create an in-memory overlay file system um, within the computer nodes, like Tachyon or something. Okay, so this is about the storage architecture. Then the next thing is the compute engine. Um, basically, we have three choices, a virtual machine, container, and a bare meta. We all know about uh, the good, the pros and cons for virtual machine. For container, we know it's, it's lightweight. Pro, uh, provisioning is very fast, but the security is, is kind of a problem because it's weaker than virtual machine. Mm, the other thing is um, uh, currently the Nova Docker driver Mm, is still not in the uh, upstream, right? So Sahara actually um, is, an, is not, not cannot support uh, uh, the container very well. Uh, the the last option is the bare metal. I know this morning um, uh, there's a panel discussing using Sahara and the bare metal together. So to me, the the good thing for bare metal is the it's has a very good, the best performance in all these three options. But the problem is that um, uh, we have tried to uh, deploy Ionic in our lab, but it seems uh, the Ionic, Ionic is uh, less mature than both VM and the container. The other thing is uh, the resource utilization efficiency is still a problem. Uh, the, you kind of still um, uh, the uh, every single virtual cluster is still uh, monopolizing a single uh, physical cluster, so there is no resource sharing at all. And uh, the migration is also a problem. The provisioning is also slower than container. So um, my point is that my, my opinion is the container seems to be the most promising technology for running um, big data on top of cloud. Um, but unfortunately, currently Sahara doesn't support the Nova uh, container very well, so there's um, many things to in ahead. On the other hand, there's another problem common to all those three options, which is with, even with Sahara, the tenants still need to concern about how to determine the appropriate size for the cluster and uh, we, what kind of flavors should be used with this cluster. So like they can choose to use a large flavor with less nodes. They can also use, use smaller flavors with more nodes. So it's not easy for tenants to make this decision. In many cases, the tenants are just um, developer or, or data scientists. They just want to use these services. They don't want to need too much about the underlying complexities. The third thing um, in the consideration is the uh, data processing API. Um, uh, by default, uh, when you finish the a pro cluster provisioning, you can use it as usual. Um, uh, tenant could uh, just uh, SSH into the virtual machines you, and consume the service as usual. If, if the uh, specific distribution provides a high-level API like Uzi, tenants could use it, that as usual. But in Sahara, we recommend to use the EDP API. EDP is designed to be an abstraction layer for users to consume the underlying service. So ideally, EDP should be vendor neutral and plugin agnostic. That means you can always um, switch among the 
the the the the, the Sahara plugins like CDH or HDEP, but unfortunately, currently yeah, EDP is still under development. Uh, we have implemented a lot of feature, but uh, um, there uh, we could add more, like more job types. Um, I believe um, uh, a few hours ago in this afternoon there is a session talking about adding more features to the uh, EDP. So there is another um, option. Uh, you can use a third-party uh, abstraction layer um, like the Cask CDAP. Cask CDAP is an ab abstraction layer to make the big data developer's life much easier than before. Uh, in theory, those components can be used to replace EDP or, or uh, anything uh, uh, that, that can do s such kind of job. So unfortunately, um, Sahara currently does not s support uh, the third part uh, abstractions. So uh, as a summary, uh, this is a matrix um, showing the, all the things you need to consider about. And the, on the bottom, there are storage and computer. There are a few options. Then it, the next one is the distributions. There are many options. But we did not talk any about anything here because it's totally up to the consumers, uh, the, the users. Right? On the top is the data processing API. Currently, we have the traditional way, the EDP, and uh, potentially we could support uh, third party APIs. So, with this all in mind, so we, uh, we are trying um, back to this page. We, we did a, a few performance testing to compare the options uh, for the storage and the computer. Uh, layer. The top layer is uh, totally about the uh, functionality, so we did not do any performance testing. So uh, we run a, um, uh, we just use a fork four node cluster to compare a few uh, configurations. So the first one is we compared the if uh, ephemeral disk performance with the bare metal disk performance. Um, so um, basically, we see uh, the the. The, on the left of this chart is the read performance, the right is the write, perform, write performance. Uh, we see 1.3x read overhead and 2.1x so, uh, write overhead. So uh, we understood uh, uh, in the cloud in, uh, context the disk access pattern totally changed, right? Because in OpenStack, a t typical configuration is that you have a bunch of disk, you create a read and uh, have a logic volume, uh, then the logic volume to the Nova instance store, then every virtual machine will have its own image file from the instance store. The access pattern is totally different from the bare metal scenario. However, our characterization shows that only 10% of the overhead are from the access pattern change. Most of the overhead is still from virtualization, over, uh, virtualization like the uh, I.O. and the memory efficiency. So um, we have already done a, a few tuning here. Not very extensive, but the performance is still not good. So we believe um, if you want to achieve, achieve uh, uh, good performance, Heavy tuning is necessary, is required. Then we compared another scenario. Uh, scenario. We moved the HDFS from the virtual machine to the host level. Um, the good thing is that we see the performance for the write case improved, improved significantly. For the read case, it's still higher, but we know the reason. The reason for the improve, improvement in write cases, and the first thing is the virtualization overhead is removed. Now the HDFS can access all the uh, disks in the uh, physical mode. Right? And uh, uh, we also know the, the uh, I mentioned the, the Neutron DVR feature help, help optimize the network path. So the, that's uh, another reason for the performance improvement. However, the reason for the write overhead is that we failed to enable the uh, uh, location awareness feature for Hadoop in uh, cloud environment called HVE. Uh, this is a feature developed by VMware in Hadoop to support their uh, uh, vSphere product. Actually, Sahara can also can benefit from that feature as well. But some somehow we tried to enable this feature, but somehow it. it didn't work in our environment. So if we can make this work, we, we expect to see a better performance for the reader case as well. Then we compare the Swift performance. 
Um, same as before, this overhead is higher than the uh, ephemeral disk case. Uh, and I believe we know the reason. The reason is um, the lo this location awareness feature for Swift is not enabled. Um, uh, we tried to enable this, but, s but somehow we run into errors. So in theory, if this feature can be turned on, then we should see similar or even better performance than the internal HDFS. So the a conclusion from last page and this page is that if we can move the data from the virtual machine to the outside, we have a chance to achieve better performance. And at the same time, as I said before, now we have a centralized storage. It may bring more business opportunities. So the last test case, test case is compared the bare metal versus container versus VM. Uh, I just said uh, uh, Sahara doesn't support the uh, container very well, so we actually did a few hackings to make the container work. We use the Nova Docker driver. So the performance shows um, the virtual machine has 2x uh, container, has 1.4x. So one thing I need to call out is that we have done a few tunings for the uh, VM case, but everything with the container case is out of the box. So it's still much better than the virtual machine case, right? So we think a uh, container is very promising in terms of performance compared to VM. Okay. So based on what have we seen in the functionality and the performance benchmarking, here is a few things in our mind that we expect to see in Sahara. This is not a low map. This is just something we think <coughs> Sahara would be better to support this. The first thing is we need an architecture to allow disaggregated computing and storage. We want Sahara to support more storage backend. It's, if possible, Sahara could be integrated with Manila. <coughs> the second thing is we need better support for container and bare meta. I believe bare meta is already in, in the roadmap. Uh, there are talks uh, in this summit. But for container, we should consider if Nova is the only option, or maybe we should use Magnum. <coughs> the third thing is the EDP as the um, abstraction layer for Sahara. It needs more improvement, like a data connector workflow, um, policy engine, SLA, auto scale, auto tune. So ideally, as I said before, the user don't want to concern about anything about the underlying infrastructure, like how many nodes, what kind of VM flavor. Ideally, the, this abstraction layer should take care of this. Even like auto scale, when the load is high, uh, the, this layer could add in more nodes to the cluster, something like that. Then finally, I think uh, Sahara should uh, offer a broader vendor integration opportunities. Not, ju not just the big data engines like Cloudera and Hortonworks. This is because a complete big data stack may have um, many options at every layer. Right? You have the uh, storage at, at the bottom, then you have the data platform, and you also may have a few uh, data analytics layer uh, components on top of that. So there are many vendors at uh, each layer. I think uh, Sahara should be open this opportunities to all the vendors. Um, CDAP is an example here. Another example like uh, SaaS analytic products. Right? Mm. OK. OK, so uh, this is pretty much uh, my talk. Then um, Trevor will continue to talk about the currently low map for the Sahara Liberty, and then conclude with a summary. OK, so uh, quick note, uh, how many questions do you think we have out there? Show of hands, people want to ask questions? I haven't thought of it yet. Because I, uh, I can talk fast or slow. All right, looks like maybe we have a couple. Um, OK, so let's see, which order? Oop, I went back too far. There we go. So that last slide wasn't a road map. This is a road map. OK, and these are, the, um, <laughs> these are the highlights for the cycle. So uh, big things we're going to be doing. Um, HDP is one of our uh, major vendor plugins. Um, it's going to be uh, ported to H 
DP 2.2, if you're f familiar with Hortonworks and Umbari, you know uh, that there are a lot of improvements there. Um, we're going to be working on HA for the CDH and HDP plugins. Um, uh, that's uh, HA at, on, on the cluster level. So there, there's, there's HA for Sahara itself. There's also HA within the cluster, within the Hadoop services. That's what that's about. Um, we uh, are using uh, heat as our primary provisioning engine now. We used to have a direct engine. Uh, we had heat as well. Heat now, the direct engine is being dedicated, uh, deprecated. Um, heat is is the uh, heat is the new heat, right? That's what you should use, and we're going to add uh, features to it. Also, plan to bring Sahara to the uh, Python OpenStack client, one-stop shopping client. Um, so that will be great. Bare metal clusters, we've already talked about several times this summit. Um, so we're going to be working on integration with Ironic. Um, security enhancements are very much on our mind uh, because we realize that that's important. So there'll be a lot of work there. Um, and also a number of things uh, in EDP land. So um, job scheduling, uh, repeatable jobs, future jobs, uh, coordinated workflows. Uh, we were just talking about that today in a panel. Uh, so you can ultimately, someday, we hope to have things like directed acyclic graphs. Uh, with dependencies from one job feeding into another, so you can uh, develop more complex things. Um, log retrieval for simple debugging. Um, very simple feature, but very helpful when something goes wrong with your job. Um, you want to know why. Uh, and also, if you've used EDP before, um, you know that some of the jobs, the uh, argument passing and parameters that you can pass to a job are somewhat fixed for some of the job types. So we have a model figured out for uh, making that much more general and much more flexible. Um, so you can run all kinds of things. Um, OK, so our call to action. Uh, we did a lot in Kilo. Um, we have real customers out there using this stuff, running real workloads. Um, we're beginning to get. Um, all kinds of customer feedback and uh, asking us to, to help them out. Um, so uh, this is something that you can you can really use. It's it's maturing. Um, let's see. Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, I guess that's a summary. I, I'm not sure <laughs> about the thought behind the second point. It's a true statement. Uh, um, <laughs> bare metal uh, is still is still preferable uh, for performance. Um, there was an interesting note on that on the panel earlier today, and and it was um, a developer uh, from Cloudera, and uh, he noted something which I, I think is true. Um, the performance characteristics are going to be uh, sort of dependent on your workload. So um, bare metal is going to be more important for people who are doing real-time analysis, on-demand kind of stuff, um, queries against data, trying to figure something out. And uh, that's where your performance is going to matter more. If you're running batch stuff in the background overnight, um, it's not going to matter as much. So there's still room. You know, VMs might be slower than bare metal. OK, fine. Does that mean if you're running Sahara, you have to go out and buy like a whole bunch of new hardware and, and use Ironic and run stuff on bare metal? Well, no, you don't. It depends on your workload. So um, there's a performance difference, and tuning is important. But it also is going to depend somewhat on who you are and what you're doing. Um, this is probably the major point um, at the end here. We're, uh, we're a smallish team. I don't know. I haven't added them up. Maybe what uh, twenty to twenty contributors, something like that. Actively, uh, really active people. We can certainly use more. We can. We come up with more awesome ideas than we have people to do. Right. So, um, as someone else said this week, if you're looking for a project, come join ours. We. I guarantee you, we'll give you something to do. Um, let's see. We have our, uh, let's see, well, we're doing, oh, great, five minutes for questions. Um, I didn't put it on this slide. Our meetup is tomorrow in room 218. That's 218. We'll be there all day long. Please come. We love visitors. Um, we had a bunch of visitors today. So come hang out with us. Tell us what you think. Ask us questions. Um, it's great. He, 
he, ha he hung out there all day today. Uh -oh. <laughs> so I guess that's it. And uh, if you have questions, please use the mic. If you don't, I'll have to repeat them. Questions from anybody for either of us. Andrew Lazarev from Mirantis, and uh, I was making performance testing uh, of Sahara uh, two, two summits before, and uh, uh, during my testing, it is really huge difference uh, in performance parameters uh, depending on configuration. So, mm -hmm. and uh, in your slides, well, just the results. Uh, can you share more details? Uh, what was host par uh, uh, host caching parameter? Which case do you mean? The, uh, uh, this one or this uh, one? For, for example, for ephemeral storage uh, use case. When uh, this one, we use the DFS IO. Yeah. Uh, actually, I compared our results with. Um, Be because test uh, speed is very uh, sensitive to, for example, chunk size. So you will get completely different results for small chunks and for big chunks. Also, tests are very sensitive to uh, host uh, uh, page file mm -hmm. configuration yeah, no. yeah, yeah. because if you enable yeah, uh, yeah we uh, in this case we enable the uh, huge page and we did see performance improvement with the huge page enabled and. Uh, uh, I think our case is a little bit different from the result you guys published last year. Uh, you guys will use the a one terabyte death cell, uh, but you use the DD as a workload. Right? We use the DFS IO. We use a much smaller data set size, only 64 gigabit, uh, gigabytes. But I, rem I, I, I compare the results. It seems it's very similar. You guys reported a 2x performance overhead. Like that, right? Yeah. And uh, what drivers uh, do you use? Uh, drivers of QM or uh, discs? Uh, no, I I mean uh, dri uh, QM drivers. Uh, big. <coughs> you Q Q -E oh, you mean oh, what kind of? Uh, uh, be because we we saw. Uh, oh, you mean uh, what I O or Q E M U? Yeah. Uh, Virtual uh, I/O drivers. I think it's uh, uh, two point something or one IO? point something, uh, because we we see yeah, uh, 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 yeah KVM, uh, but uh, Andrew's question is uh, uh, the driver mode for the storage is uh, what I/O or or K KVM uh. Yeah, b version of driver. I mean, because uh, we see a huge difference between uh, one point something yeah, and two point something. I know. So it's uh, what, what driver was the, used for? Uh, the, um, depends on what is the default in OpenStack Nova. So I think for this part we did not do much tuning. We only tuned a few OS level parameter like huge pages. So um, we tried to make the performance looks better, but on the other hand, uh, we realized maybe we 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 just needed to show the out of the box performance that. Uh, the majority of the customer will see. So we don't want to do too much tuning or too extensive tuning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, hi. <laughs> so during this week, I've heard um, two conflicting things. So some people say, oh, um, compute nodes have local storage, almost always. And then other people say, compute nodes are always use network stor uh -huh. storage. And I'm saying that when you look at this problem, so you were saying that the overhead is mostly because of I.O. Do you see a solution that um, makes this optimal in both cases? Um, it's more like a curiosity. I don't really have a question. Well, uh, you know, the data here, we compared a few cases. We don't really, we did not really compare the uh, local storage versus the remote storage. Mm -hmm. So currently, we don't have data points to show how bad or how good if you put all the storage on the network remote side. But do you think the, the overheads would be the same if you're comparing um, network I.O. and disk I.O., so you have the same? Uh, oh, no. I, 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 I would expect uh, worse performance if you use the 
totally separated uh, safe or cluster FS as the storage backend mm -hmm. because after all, all the data traffic goes through the network. But uh, on the other hand, it's a typical deployment in for most open stack, right? The, uh, people like to use the safe as the universal backend for both Glance, Nova, and uh, Cinder. So, um, and uh, if, if, if you deploy safe or, and, or cluster together with the computer node, they may bring other issues like resource contention. You, you, you will not get a determined, um, determined uh, performance. So that's one thing we plan to do in the future. Uh, we will compare the performance. Uh, in those cases, the, the disks are all co-located with the computer node. We will compare those cases with other cases like a network remote safe or cluster FS. Right, so you don't believe that the overhead is the IO itself, it's just the, yeah. the usage of the disk. Yeah. So okay. I think we're over time. Uh, so we love to answer your questions anyway. So come on up and we'll answer them. But I guess that's it for the official talk. <laughs>